thank you for allowing me to open this wonderful conference. Um, I hope I uh, can set the stage. It's a bit of a daunting task, but I, I'll, I'll do my best. The microbiome. There's a lot of hype, a lot of excitement. I, I gave a talk here about three, three four years ago, and there we, uh, I have to say that we knew very, very, very little, and there was almost nothing that we knew, but there was a lot to be discovered. And now we're three, four years further, and I don't think you have been able to avoid the microbiome in the, in the cancer field. And so I'm here to give you some of our recent work and some of the, the, the things that have been published um, uh, internationally. So this is how I look at you. I'm a microbiologist. I look at you as half human, half microbe, because that's more or less the count we, uh, we have. We, we assume more or less that for every human cell you have in your body, there's also a microbe living in and on us. And of course, that is a good thing, as we uh, know by now. Um, there's also an enormous promise, uh, disclosures, an enormous promise in the, in, the, in the microbiome field, namely that the microbiome is going to be able to diagnose and cure all major diseases on this planet. Um, of course, this is what you think if you believe the newspapers. Um, the, there's a tremendous hype also around this field, and it's, it's sometimes a challenge as a microbiome uh, amateur, let's put it this way, um, to, to, to fight this, this constant, continuous balance of being very excited about what you do, but also have to temper the expectations because this is still a very young field. Now you see, you see on, the, on the world all the different uh, diseases that are, that are being sought after, but one thing that, that became very clear to us in the very early days, now we're talking about 2010, 2012, is that we did not have a very good reference. And so the first efforts we put in, in, in the field were, were not, well, were also looking at the microbiome in disease, but also trying to build that reference frame, that, that diagnostic, um, those diagnostic borders of what a healthy microbiota is, because there's n nothing we can do in disease if we don't know what health should be looking like and what health should be, uh, and what we should aim for in clinical trials. Um, and for this reason, we started a project uh, some while ago now called the Flemish Gut Flora Project in, 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 in Flanders, which is in the north of Belgium, in which we, we monitored the healthy population. Uh, and we, we monitored about 3,400 individuals with a bunch of questionnaires, a bunch of samples, etc. Cetera, et cetera. I won't bore you with the details, but this, this cohort is a living cohort, and, is a, and, and, and given the age bracket that we're looking at, uh, is, is, um, which is around 40 or 50 of age, is actually a very interesting cohort for longitudinal follow-up uh, in, in, in areas such as, such as colon cancer. And so we'll be resampling this cohort uh, end of this year, about five to six years later. And so this will be a very interesting exercise, also in the context of, of this meeting. Now, what I, what, I, what I do want to say is we learned a lot about fecal sampling and, and, and managing of fecal samples and, and the right protocols. And if you're, if you're interested on what, the, in my view, <laughs> the right protocols, the right way of doing things are, I, I, really, will, oh, oh, sorry. I really want to refer to this, um, oh, there's no beamer here, that's right. I really want to refer to this thing at the bottom, uh, which is a review which describes all the logistics and all the tricks that we've implemented in, in doing so and how to collect your samples right. Because if there's one thing that we've learned in the microbiome field is that the way you collect your samples, the way you treat your samples, the way you ship your samples, the way you extract your DNA, it all matters a great, great deal. And so that is, that is one important thing to learn. Now, one thing that we've, we saw in this, in the, in this, in this study was, was also what are the factors uh, affecting microbiota variation in health. And so we built a list of confounder, confounding factors which are necessary to do proper clinical studies. So I, we identified the importance of monitoring transit time. We, we identified the importance of monitoring diet. We identified the importance of taking simple things like age and gender into account because it does matter for the microbiome readouts. And another thing that we, we identified as a confounder were drugs. Uh, drugs is, is, was probably the category that had the most, as a group, the most effect on microbiota composition uh, in, in healthy individuals. Because, so these are individuals that are 
uh, just taking very normal uh, over-the-counter drugs, uh, but also, but already there we saw very strong effects of laxatives, antibiotics, but also things like antihistamines or, or NSIDs or whatever. There are lots of lots of small effects of many different drugs, but also in the more severe. Um, uh, area of, 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 of pat, uh, pathologies, we find these associations. We, we, the, the study that's mentioned here at the bottom is a, is a study in which we found that, for example, metformin in type 2 diabetes, type 2 diabetes is a very important confounder. Now, why am I saying all this? This is, of course, extremely relevant also in, uh, in cancer and in cancer therapy. And, and I, I don't think you, you have been able to avoid this, this thing here. We've seen that in many, many um, uh, forms of cancer, uh, there's a strong interaction between the microbiota and the treatment. And the, 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 the direction goes both ways. The treatment affects the microbiota. We see very strong effects, for example, of chemotherapy on microbiotic composition, but also the other way around. The, the microbiota ha is, has an influencing factor on the treatment and the most, the, the most um, Striking examples are, of course, those of immunotherapy, where we see that, that the microbiota composition can uh, uh, predict or at least is associated with uh, immunotherapy response. Now, this work is mo has mostly been focusing on, let's say, melanoma and, and some other uh, cancers. Uh, in, in, the, in the GI tract, that is still a little bit to be, to be, um, to be sought after because of the, the differing um, um, treatment responses we see in, 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 in colorectal cancer. But again, I think that this is just a matter of time before we also see there an, an important confounder effect of the, of the microbiota. Um, so in the progression of, of uh, the different stages of, of, of the microbiota, of, of, of CRC, we there, we've sort of started to build a model on how different bacteria could uh, interact with the tumor progression and, and, and contribute to the development of the, and, and possibly the, uh, the, the prognosis or diagnosis of, of, of disease. And in the, this, is a, this is a slide which is 2014, where things were still quite simple. If you now look in the, at, at the current stage, there's been a bunch, a bunch of papers uh, identifying a wide range of bacteria in various, with various mechanisms, both pro and, 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 and anti-tumoral in, in effect. And, and so it, it's becoming very, very complex. And in only a few years' time, I can, I can recommend uh, this review. It has a very good overview. Um, and so what we, what we see is that, that we, we see certain bacteria who, through a wide range of different effectors, have anti-tumoral effects. Be aware, this is not all in humans. Some of this is in model systems. And another range of, of bacteria that have pro-tumoral effects and could lie at the, uh, at the bi uh, basis of, of, um, of, uh, of tumor development. The, the, the classic examples in the field here are, for example, uh, Fusobacterium nucleatum, uh, and Bacteroides fragilis, Escherichia um, coli, some of the uh, things, where already mechanisms have been put forward on how they could contribute. But at this moment, we, we, we only have this patchwork of different studies who see different effects of different bacteria in different model, model systems and, and, and added, added to that a little bit of, of human observations but again, we don't really know who are the real, the most important culprits here or who are the most beneficial bacteria and who are not. There is a, there is a patchwork of activities and it's probably also linked to the patchwork of different cancer types uh, we, are, we are facing. Again, but the, the message here is there's been tremendous progress and there's many, many different things that are being picked up these days. Um, and so the, the question is also not only in terms of mechanistic things, do we, do we, do we see do we understand which, which bacteria are, are causally relevant for the, for the development or the protection against this disease, but could we also use the microbiota for diagnostic purposes? And I want to bring back to this, this, this is one of the, one of, one of the early papers in the field um, where very early on Fusobacterium uh, was, was, di was di discovered as an important marker uh, uh, and associated with, with tumor, um, tumors in uh, detection in, in patients. Um, 
then more research started to appear where, where people started to build models based on combinations of bacteria that were detected mostly in stool samples uh, at this time where they could actually see that, that, that models of, the, of, of microbiota markers were able to at least match and sometimes outperform classic, uh, classic screening tests such as the, the fecal occult blood test. Um, and so it, it's, it, it was getting interesting. There was, there was a promise for, 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 for diagnosis. And now recently, a very nice uh, meta-analysis appeared, I can really recommend that, Nature Medicine this year, um, who basically took all of these different studies, because I just saw, showed you two, but he took all of these different studies and tried to integrate all of that information to find are there signals, are there diagnostic signals that we can replicate across different cohorts in different continents uh, um, and different study setups, eh? because all of these different studies did things slightly different, and, and the, the authors here did a, did a very nice effort of trying to integrate uh, uh, that data. And so, lo and behold, they could indeed find a core of bacteria that kept on coming back and that, that, that were discovered in one cohort and replicated in others, or, or, or found by combining uh, a bunch of cohorts, but being able to replicate in independent cohorts. Anyway, there's, a, there's this emerging, emerging signal of, of, um, of bacteria that are, that are systematically being associated to uh, uh, CRC. And so what, I, what, I, what, I, what is interesting to show here is that, that where you see at, at the bottom there, there's this group of bacteria where you see that the signal outperforms the signal uh, in, induces, induced by the variance of the different studies because there is a lot, a lot of study variance available and that, that is something that makes replication so difficult in, in, this, in this field. Um, when you then start to look at what these bacteria, how they are related, you can actually see that some of these bacteria co-occur. So if you see the one, you see the other. They form little clusters of co-abundant bacteria, little, probably some kinds of communities that you see in similar circumstances. And they, they, the authors here also did an, a, a nice effort in trying to identify some of these surf, uh, circumstances. Some of it is that you see some of these clusters de depending on the localization, left versus right. Uh, sometimes you see, you see these things uh, based on the, on the CRC stage, early versus late. Some of the, 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 the clusters, one of these clusters is um, the one which has plenty of uh, porphyroronas, um, has, uh, is specifically associated to the presence of rectal tumors, right? And so there, the, 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 there is a signal or a story appearing here that these many different markers tend to also give different little stories of little aspects of the phenotype. And I'll come back to that uh, later in my talk. Now, when they try to bring in together, the all things together, they build models based on species composition or on functional composition, basically which, which genes are encoded in these bacteria and which function do they encode. You can, build mod, you can try to build diagnostic models from that. And you see that on average, you're reaching uh, um, rock arc values of 70 to 80 percent. Now, in the microbiome field, that is actually pretty good. And especially when, because the authors did, went to great efforts trying to replicate this on, on independent cohorts that were completely uh, uh, um, left out of the discovery part of the study. I think that is, that, that is very, um, very impressive. And so I think there's, this, this will be further um, fine-tuned, I would say, and, and, and I, I have the feeling that on the diagnostic side, the microbiota is, some, is, is something that will contribute hopefully in the earliest screening forms. At the moment, it is CRC versus non-CRC, but we're hoping to, to make that a bit more prognostic in the, in the early days. Um, uh, Anne, I want, the one thing that I do want to show is, is, as I said earlier, there is a very important effect of the study variability. There is the, the, if you just take it as a whole, the microbiota, you measure its variability, then you see that between studies, it is very, very big, and it's much bigger than, than, those, than those signals. The, the authors really needed to, to really uh, nicely align the studies uh, and, and the, way, the way things, the data was treated in order to see the signals. Eh? It, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't that easy. Uh, and I think, I think it emphasizes again the, very much the importance of A, controlling for the confounders, what I, what I said earlier on, because there is a, st a strong effect in, 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 by the confounders. And 
uh, emphasizes even more the standardization of approaches that every, every although if, you, if you're now starting to think of large international studies, I would really recommend standardization of approaches, uh, basically running all the microbiota analysis in one lab, if, I, if it's up to me. And so I think it's, it, it, is, it is something that might, will be a challenge in international cooperation, but at the same time, it will lead to more robust results. Now, most of what I've said up till now is, is linked to uh, uh, fecal samples, right? And, and because it's the best accessible uh, uh, um, uh, sample for, for screening purposes, it's without a doubt uh, one, of the, one of the most interesting things. But if you want to understand pathomechanisms, if you want to understand what's going on on the tumor or on the polyp or in, in adjacent to the polyp, etc., we, we need to also look at what's happening in, in the mucosa. And so that is usually done using biopsies. And the, 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 there, the interesting, the interesting part is that there's a lot less replication between studies. There's a lot less congruence. We see that sometimes uh, uh, studies agree that, for example, in this study, the, 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 they compare two data sets and the, and the markers uh, that, that tend to be, tended to be associated to the tumor versus the um, um, adjacent, for example, to the tumor, tended to be the same in independent studies. But at the same time, there's other studies where, you com where, where, where they compared, uh, in this case, a Spanish cohort and a U.S. cohort, and there was very little overlap between these different markers. And so, and that is, I, I, if, if we take that on a whole, if we then take all of the studies which looked at tumors, again, there are some signals that, 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 are, that persist, physobacterium, Although, not always, um, uh, and, but many signals that are study specific or, 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 or et cetera, that do not replicate. And so the question is, why is that? Is that, is that because these signals are false? It's really not true. Is it has to do with, 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 with sampling procedures, et cetera, et cetera. And so in, in that light, we, 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 spend, we, we started a project sponsored by, by Janssen to, to really look at, at the adenoma to carcinoma progression and to really study the, the mucosa adherent microflora in these, in these things. And, um, it's a collaboration um, between different studies. Uh, the, the, the study clinicians here are, are Sabine Teshpar and Evelyn Decker from, from Leuven and, and Amsterdam, um, where, where we basically looked at a whole bunch of mostly biopsies. We collected saliva samples, we collected soil samples, but the emphasis of the project is on the biopsies. Now, unfortunately, I, 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 I can't show the, most of the results yet, uh, but what I, what I want to show already is, is the importance of how things are sampled. Um, the, 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 we, we did a lot of benchmarking on what techniques you, one would need to do, what, 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 what the effects would be, and we, we see basically we see effects all over the place. Right? We, we did very rigorous protocol on how the biopsy should be taken. We, we, this is, this is happens on one side in, in, our, in our case, so biopsies they don't stay uh, out in the open very long. Uh, but, they, but still, there, there are some important effects. And so one of the important effects is the DNA RNA extraction kit. If, if you use a different kit, you get a completely different microbiome profile. And that is very, very worrying, right? Because if you want to compare across, across countries and studies, this is, this is a very important effect. Um, the way the biopsy is stored, for example, you, you collect it flash frozen uh, uh, with liquid nitrogen, or you collect it in an RNA later so that you can preserve it at room temperature, has very strong effects. My opinion is that we should not be using RNA later. And I know that people like to use RNA later for their, for their RNA-seq uh, experiments, but for microbiota research, it, 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 it biases results, and most importantly, it, it, it introduces a lot of contaminants. And the contaminations tend to, there's papers out there, I, I, I don't want to point at anybody, but there's papers out there where some of the signals are things where we see these are contaminant signals. And so we need to be very, very careful uh, about, about that. So if you ask me, flash frozen. Um, uh, and then the, this is, this is the, the, was actually one of the most disappointing results given the, the, the large uh, uh, um, collections that are available worldwide is that we see very strong effects of fixation procedures. We use FFPE or CARNO or Metacarn. They, they all introduce contaminants. They all mo modify, they, some of them modify the microbial profile. So in, 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 from our perspective, these samples that, are, that have been preserved 
for a longer period are actually not very useful for microbiota research. And that's, of course, a shame given all of these, all of these historical collections. Um, yeah, it is, it is what it is. I, I, hope, I, I was hoping I was wrong here, but I, I, I don't think I am. Um, so then the, then the question is, how can we further improve? Because we see, we see this, 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 um, all, these, all these problems in the, in the extraction, but at the same time, you want to, you want to further reduce the, the biases and you further want to understand really what's going on to really understand of all of these bacteria, which ones are the, now the, the important ones and which are the ones that are really relevant to the, the pathogenesis. And, and so we've, we, we, we built, uh, we developed a technique in the lab, which we call quantitative microbiome profiling, um, where basically we did, we did the transition here from A to B. Uh, if, you, if you now at this moment would read any microbiome paper, you would see results of the A type. The A type means you will see a profile of bacteria and this, this profile is a relative profile. It will say you have 20% of these bacteria, 30% of these bacteria. 20% of Physobacterium, 30% of, of, of Porphyumoronas. So I, 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 I like to say that I think that that is a wrong way of looking at it, despite that this is the thing we've been doing for more than 10 years in the microbiome field, right? And the reason why I think it's wrong is I, th I think you can get this feeling yourself. So this, on the left, you have a relative profile. On the right, you have an absolute profile. The right is what we now developed. We, co we combine flow cytometry with sequencing to get absolute abundances, numbers of cells of bacteria per gram of, in this case, fecal material. So just have a look at, look at the, I don't know, one of those yellow ones, take one on the left and take one on the right. You could see that, that the yellow, you, would, you, you could probably find two individuals which have more or less the same amount of yellow, in this case, bacteroiditis. So that is, that is about 10, 20% of bacteroiditis in these samples. Then you go to the right and you have the same individuals in the same order, but what you will see is that one individual will have a lot of bacteroides when expressed in absolute cells of bacteria, a number of bacteria, and the, that same individual which had the same relative amount actually has a lot less. And I would dare to say that the body doesn't care about relative abundances. The tumor doesn't care about relative abundances. It doesn't care whether it has 20% fusobacterium on it. It cares how many fusobacteria it has, uh, has on it and how many metabolites they produce and how many, and, and with, to what degree they, they, they um, trigger the immune system, right? That is what matters. So we, we are strong believers in the fact that if you really want to flesh out all of these different signals and really find those signals that are truly relevant to the pathogenesis of the disease, we should measure in, in absolute terms. And I, I, don't have, I don't have CRC data on this yet. But what I do have is data in IBD. And I think this is, I think this is important given the fact that a lot of um, that, that a lot of, or a fraction of IBD patients do progress into CRC. And so what we, what we found using this, this technique of, of absolute quantification is that we, we, we discovered a novel enterotype. An enterotype is a way to classify individuals. Normally there was three, so I could take this room and I could divide you in three groups. We discovered a fourth. We call it the B2, the Bacteroides 2 enterotype. It's an enterotype where people have very low numbers of bacteria, uh, very low cell densities. And the, the surprising discovery in this was that this enterotype is something that seems to be universal across many diseases. If you look at the, at the graph on the right, on the left you will have the, the two first uh, groups of, of, of bar, uh, bar charts are healthy controls. The Bacteroides 2 enterotype is the, is the, the red one, the red, uh, and, and you will see that it has a low incidence. There's about 10% in the healthy, so-called healthy population that has that enterotype. Now, if you see in patients having ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, primary sclerosis and cholangitis, or mixed forms of, of, these, of these diseases, we see an amazing increase in incidence. It goes to up to 80 or 90% in Crohn's disease patients. And so what we've discovered is that, that, this, that this enterotype is an enterotype 
that is directly uh, linked to, uh, to, the, to the inflammatory levels. And it's not only, not only the inflammatory levels when we speak about the intestine, so we, as we measure in fecal calprotectin, we also measure this systemically because also the CRP of these individuals is, is elevated. So this B2 enterotype is a inflammatory Pro, probably also pro-inflammatory uh, chicken egg. It's always a difficult thing in the in the in the in the field. Um, a pro-inflammatory state that that, in my view, would could would could be a precursor to CRC development. But that we still need to we still need to flesh out in more detail in in dedicated cohorts. Now the other thing that that I that I wanted to mention here is. When you use such a technique, you can, you can really, and, and, and control for the right confounders, you can really flesh out what the signal is. Again, I am very sorry, I don't have uh, CRC data yet, but what I do have is, is, is when we look at these different diseases, PSC and UC and CD, what we can, what we can see is we, what we, we have these different marker bacteria for these diseases, and we could link them not to yes, no disease, yeah, they, are, they, were, they were discovered as initial yes-no markers, but now we can pinpoint them to specific phenotypes within this disease. We can find those bacteria that are specifically associated to the inflammation. We can find those bacteria that are specifically uh, uh, associated to the, the, the bile duct obstruction in, in PSC. And so we can have all these markers that pop up in different studies and we can start saying, okay, this study found that marker, why? Because that's a bile duct st a signal. This found, study found that signal, why? Because that's an inflammatory signal. This study found that signal, why? Because that's a contamination of their samples. So we start to be, be able to start teasing out these different things. And I think that's also something we can do in the, in the cancer field, which we're actually doing right now uh, in, in, our, in our CRC samples trying to figure out these, 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 different, these different effects. And just to give you one uh, usual suspect of the CRC field, also Fusobacterium in this cohort was a very strong inflammatory, inflammation associated marker. Uh, but the interesting thing is that, that, that not always. So we have a, a, an interesting uh, opposing relationship between Fusobacterium and Veonella, which also associated to, to, to inflammation. But we see Fusobacterium, for example, more in Crohn's patients or PSC Crohn's patients, and we see Veonella more in pure PSC or in ulcerative colitis patients. So depending on the disease, we see different markers for the same phenotype. So it becomes, it becomes pretty complex. But, it's, but I think the field is at the stage where because we know the confounders, because we know how to collect properly, because we, we, we measure quantitatively, we can actually start teasing apart all of these different, um, these different signals. So it's work in progress. I, I really hope to be back here next year and tell you how we tease apart the signal in, in, in CRC. Uh, we are applying these techniques uh, right now. So, just to, to wrap up, I'd, I'd like to give you some of the, some of the lessons we've learned in the, in the, in the last few years. Um, I think it's very important to describe the healthy microbiota. And I think in any clinical study, it's very important to collect a good reference population or to project your samples on a large population study. Um, the, the reference population should be chosen not only to match for clinical confounders, but also please take into account the microbiota confounders. We know what they are, and I think it's important to do so. Um, I think there's a clear potential for microbiome diagnostics and prognostics in, in CRC. The, the field has progressed enormously in the, last, in the last few years, and I think we'll be able to, 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 up, to, to up the prediction and, and, and diagnostic rates of the microbiome um, in, the, in the coming years. There's a wide range of targets now appearing and mechanistic insights are appearing every single day, some of which replicate, some of which don't. I think at the, 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 big, the big question at this moment is what is the relative importance of these different markers or these different processes? Is it, is it tumor induction? Is it the inflammatory uh, route? Is it, is it uh, um, small molecules produced by the bacteria? Several different theories, the, theories appear driven by different bugs, and now, it's an, now it becomes the time of finding when and where this, this, these different processes uh, are appearing and how important their relative importance is. Um, I think the, the better we do our profiling, the better our results will be. Quantitative profiling will be important. 
good confounder control, intervention studies are, are, are down. there's a lot of drug, drug intervention studies where now routinely microbiota is measured. We'll be, do, we'll, be, we'll be seeing a lot of things and this will allow to disentangle the signals as we've seen in the PSC example and priori, prioritize the targets. And most, most, most importantly, the, 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 the coherence in methods is, is absolutely crucial, especially for the biopsies. Um, the way you sample extract, amplify, and, con and control for your confounders is, is very, very important in these, in these low biomass samples. Um, and with that, I have a, a, a lot of people to thank. There's all the, the people in the, in the lab over the years, but especially in this, in this particular context, I'd like to thank our collaborators on, in, in, in our CRC work, and most importantly, Sabine Teshpar. Um, then with that, the, the funders of our work, and of course, you for your attention. Thank you.